Okay, um, we are uh, talking about ABL tree again today. Um, and let's see, programming assignment number two is out. It's due on uh, November 1st. And our plan today is to talk about ABL tree rotations. Um, just so that you remember, uh, ABL trees are a binary search tree uh, that has these three properties. Uh, binary, uh, it's a search tree, so it has the left child stuff is less than the root and the right child stuff is greater than the root, but it also has a balance property. The balance property says that the height of the left child is within one of the height of the right child. So the heights of two children, two siblings, are almost the same. And this is true at every node in the tree. That's the balance property. So, as a warm up for today, uh, consider the following three trees. Are these ABL trees or not? like 15 seconds more. Is it good? Everybody okay? Ready to go? Okay. Is the first, the leftmost tree, is it an ABL tree? No, why not? Yeah, if I look at number, if I look at the root of this tree with a key, with a, a key value of nine, it has one child which has height two, and the other child has height zero. And so the difference between the heights is not within one, it's two. How about the middle tree? Is the middle tree, you may have seen this one before. No, why not? What, 17, okay. This is a, this is a node that has, remember, null is minus height minus one. And the one on the right, the child on the right has height one. And minus one minus minus one is minus two, which is also out of balance more than one. What about the third tree? No? Doesn't it have to be the case that one of them's a, a binary, an ABL tree? So what's wrong with the third tree? Eight. Eight is balance. Again, it's got one tree that has a height of one and another child which has a height of minus one and so it's out of balance. So suppose that I wanted to fix this and suppose that I just uh, went in there and fixed it by doing um, this. You still don't like it. You like it. No, you don't like it. Is, is this an ABL tree? Well, now I've got this, is no, this node right here with the added addition of the child nine has two children, and their heights are within one of each other. So we have uh, no problem with that. But what? Yeah. Yeah, we have this four that's down here. This is violating the search tree property. 
it also has to be true. Remember binary, remember these AVL trees are binary search trees. First and foremost, they're binary search trees, but then they're balanced. So even though we have the balance property in this case, when I add that node nine, we still don't have this uh, as a binary search tree because the four is violating uh, the property that everything in the in the uh, right subtree of five has to be larger, and that's not true. Is this okay? Is everybody now warmed up with AVL trees? You remember what they are? Any questions about this definition sort of thing? Okay. Um, so this is like a, a, a structure um, that is a node structure for an AVL tree. It contains the normal sort of stuff that we've seen before. A key, this is implementing a binary search tree to do a dictionary. So there's a key associated with some data, which I wrote in gray because I'm actually not going to ever write the data value in the nodes in this class, pretty much. You just have to imagine that they're there. So, uh, and then there's also this added value. Oh, it also has a left child and a right child. That's the same as in a binary search tree. But it has this added field, which is height. Why? Why do I store the height inside of the node? Yeah, I use it to calculate balance. That's exactly what I'm going to use it for. But why Why wouldn't I just recalculate it? Uh, because if you were to, for example, remove more add node, you have to know the end of the other one. Uh, but can I just calculate it? Why can't I just, I mean, why, can, why should I just, why should I store this in the structure? It's wasting space. I mean, I just have to calculate it. Why don't I just calculate it when I need it? Like, I want to check the balance of my two children. I say, hey, tell me what you're height is. And it says, okay, just a second. All right, get right back to you. And it calculates its height. And then I yell down to the other child, hey, what's your height? Why don't I store it? Yeah, if I have to recalculate it, what's the running time to recalculate the height of my child in an AVL tree? What's the cost to, to what's the cost to calculate the height of a child in an AVL tree in the worst case? Wow. You can tell me anything. Anybody? You. Yeah. Do you know how high your child? How high is a tree? And a yellow tree. Okay. So the amount of time that it's going to take to calculate the height is to explore down from a node until you get to its deepest leaf. Or another way to do that is to call for things to give it information about the height. This is going to take at least log in time to do it. And in fact, what does it really have to do? It has to know which one of those children is the taller one to get the height. And it has to, so therefore it has to calculate the height of the two children. But each of the two children need to know the height of their larger child owner. So even though the height is log n, which is, I mean, it should be that it takes log n time because that's all you have to do is go down to the deepest child. But you have to find the deepest, to find the deepest leap. And so the recalculation costs for doing height calculations are linear for nodes in the tree. It's the size of a subtree, and that's too expensive. So it's it's too expensive to recalculate. Whenever we want to check for our balance situation. Now, of course, what you would do is you would just calculate all the heights 
you would calculate them via this recursive process, and you would get all of the heights in how much time? How much time does it take to calculate all of the heights in a tree? So I want to annotate. I, I give you a tree, and it has a height field in all the nodes, and I want you to fill those in. Right? And can you do it in linear time? So you definitely need to fill in a slot in every one of those nodes so you know that the running time is going to be at least linear. But can you do it in linear time? Okay, let's just vote. How many people think you can do it in linear time? How many people think... Oh, wait. Take your time. I'll wait. How many people think you can do it, can, in linear time? How many people think you cannot? It will take something like n log n time. Something like that. Okay, interesting. How would you calculate it in linear time, one of the linear time people? Who was a linear time person? Now see, they're all quiet. Okay. An excellent answer. Use post-order traversal. Post-order traversal visits the left subtree, calculates all the heights in the left subtree, visits the right subtree, calculates all the heights in the right subtree, and then given those two values at the root of those two trees, the, the two children, it takes constant time to calculate the height of the parent. So the running time of that is linear. It takes size of the left subtree to calculate the left one, size of the right subtree to calculate the right one, and one more step, which is the amount of bringing those two together and taking the max to calculate the parents. So it's like a recurrence relation, and the re solution of that recurrence relation is linear. 1 plus t of left plus t of right, where left plus right is n minus 1. Very familiar. It's funny. Linear time. Linear time. Okay, linear time. Okay, I, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about EVL trees. So, if I gave you a binary search tree, just a random binary search tree, you might have to go through a lot of effort in order to, to balance it. You might have to move things around quite a bit to balance it. But the way that AVL trees work is that they start life as AVL trees. Initially, it's an empty tree, and an empty tree is an AVL tree. Then there are operations that are performed, insertions, and then deletions maybe, some find operations. But each of those operations, the goal is to maintain the AVL tree properties. So we don't necessarily need to convert a general, generic binary search tree into an AVL tree. What we have to do is maintain balance over the operations insertion, deletion, and find. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to try to stay balanced. So I give you an initial binary search tree, which is an AVL tree, and somebody inserts five into it. So how do we how do we do this? How do we insert five? You know how to insert five. This is a binary search tree. Yeah. I like red better too. Can I do purple? Okay. Dark purple or light purple? I think that one. It's like more sort of gothic or something. I don't know. Oh, so much better. Okay. Uh, what do we do? We just insert it like we do in a binary search tree, right? You give me a new key. I look at the root value. I mean the key at the root. And I say 5 is smaller than 9, and I go this way. And 5 is larger than 4, and it goes this way. And 5 is smaller than 8, and it goes this way. 5 is smaller than 7, it goes here. It gets inserted as a leaf. It gets inserted as a leaf. That's what happens when you insert things into binary search trees. Unfortunately, 
the new tree is no longer an AVL tree. The node here that's circled in black, that node, and I'm always going to use black to circle the nodes that are bad. This is a bad node because it's out of balance. Its left child has height 1 and its right child has height minus 1. So the difference between the heights is bigger than 1. So it's no longer in balance. And so we have to solve this problem. And we want to perform as few operations as possible in order to restore balance to this tree. So the first, well, OK, let's see if you can invent AVL trees. Well, I'll give you one hint. It's called rotation. What do you think is going to happen when we want to modify this tree? What is the new tree going to look like? I want you to minimize the number of things you've got to manipulate to change so that you get an AVL tree. You know, it's worthwhile brainstorming about this because if you invent this, then if you lived in the 1950s, you would be, it would be named after you. Or you might have come up with a better name for it. So think about how you might do this. You know, this is too long. Oops. This, this whole part here is too long. We want it to be sort of shorter. And so what we'd like to do is kind of manip manipulate that subtree so that it becomes shorter. Yeah, that's exactly what you want to do. So do that again. Yeah, great. Did everybody, everybody knew this, like they were just humoring me? Okay, well, we'll see. What I want to do is take this subtree and restructure it so it's nice. Nice means more balanced. How can I do that? Only in that subtree, there's only one thing I can do, really. And that's to create a new subtree that looks like this. And put it in place of the subtree which is rooted at 8. So now this subtree contains the same keys as the other subtree. It's obeying the binary search properties and it's balanced. And we plug that in here. This is called a rotation. You want to see the animation? This is like a really, it's an expensive operation. Let's see. Here is the original tree. Here, this node B, that's the node 8 that was circled before. It's the one we're going to try to restructure. This is a general picture of the configuration, right? Before we looked at the previous, we just had one, two, three nodes in a chain. That would be one, two, three nodes like this. The green tree would be one node, and the, yeah, and the blue and the gray trees would be empty. But in general, the operation I'm going to, I'm going to show you here in this lovely animation, uh, that operation works in general for trees that are shaped like this. What's happened is there's been an insertion. It's caused this tree, the X tree, to become deep, deep deeper, and it's caused B to go out of balance. And so here we go. Have I made you excited enough? Here we go. Here it goes. Wow. Is that great or what? Okay. Let's watch it again. That's why it's called a rotation. So what's happening is that the the you know, it's just a picture, right? It's only what really is happening is you're going from this tree to that tree. And you'll notice that in the middle of that, there's a reassignment of left child and right child happening. And that's really all that's happening. 
except for one other thing. There's a reassignment of the root. So the root changes from B to A. And then A's right child slips forward to become B's left child. Now, I know you're thinking this is the easiest thing in the world, and it is, and that's what you should think. But if you do get confused, if you ever get confused about how to restructure ADL trees, you can take away the confusion by remembering that what you're restructuring into must be a binary search tree. So you have to reattach. If I decide to move A to be the root, I have to reattach Y in this particular way. It's the set of elements that were, if I back up, it's the set of elements that were smaller than B but larger than A. All right, that's what, these are the smaller than B and larger and larger than A. That's what those nodes are. The, 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 blue, the blue tree, all the nodes in there have that property because it's a binary search tree. And so when I restructure, I have to put that tree in a place where it's still smaller than B and larger than A. But you have to read those sentences in the other order. It's larger than A and smaller than B. That's the only difference. So that's all that happens in these single rotations. Anybody have any question about this? I'll do a general picture uh, right away after we marvel at the magic of animation. Okay, here's the uh, what happens in our tree. We get a single rotation that produces a new tree. And it's interesting in this uh, rotation to consider what happens to the, um, the heights of the tree as well as the structure. So when we started, or maybe after we inserted five, the height of eight is two. After we perform the rotation, the height of the node that's in eight's position is now one. In the previous tree, before this single rotation, so there was a previous tree which looked like nine, and it had a couple of things, 20 and whatever, whatever, whatever. What was the height of the node eight in the previous tree? before the insert five. What was the height of eight in this tree? Not in this tree, but in the tree. Maybe I should, nah, I won't. What was the, what was the tree before I inserted five in it? It was like, oh, I can't do this. If I was really tall, I could cover up the five. Okay. So that's the tree before you insert 5. And then 8 has height 1 in that old tree. We inserted 5, and then 8 got height 2. We rotated, done a, did a single rotation. We got back to having height 1. So the heights of these, these, these nodes are changing, and... And it's kind of nice the way they're changing. So that's, that's what I want to show you in the next slide, is sort of how these heights change when you perform these institutions. So here's the general scheme of the rotate right. There's a symmetric rotate left. Like you can imagine if the, instead of the rotating this way, you want this way. So originally, after we perform the insertion, where the insert goes into this subtree called X, the height at B is H plus 2. And after the rotation, and after readjusting the uh, structure of the tree, the height of the tree at node, the new root, it's replacing B, which is A, the height drops back to H plus 1, which is what it was before. I find this slide extremely clear. 
totally, totally unambiguous and perfectly understandable. Why, you say? <laughs> because I've seen it lots and lots of times. But you have not seen it maybe lots and lots of times. Therefore, I'm giving you the chance right now to say, what the heck is this thing? Nobody's going to take me up on that? Yeah. Well, so, if you talk about a specific um, tree that we were looking at earlier, H would be zero because it would be the height of the new node five. H is the height, yes, is zero. Yes. It looks like you're saying, you know, Y and bring in the phone to the Yes, they're correct. You're absolutely correct. I'm taking Y. I'm surgically cutting it off from A, and I'm reattaching it as a left child of B. So in the previous example, what were the points cutting points that you were looking at? For for this in in this case we don't have anything. We don't have a subtree that's hanging off of seven. Right, in the, in the, if we had a little subtree that was hanging off of 7, then we would, well, we wouldn't have that because we would already be in trouble. This would not, if this had something on it before we inserted 5, this would not be an AVL tree. So that's not going to happen. So that's not going to be there. But if it was there, like if this was maybe a little bit deeper and this was a little tree here, then this would be why and it would get reattached to be uh, wherever it would get reattached to. X, Y, then it would come up to there and it would become attached here. That little tree. But, no, it can't happen because if it was here, here. Is it possible that there could be a node here before we perform the insert five? Excellent question. Why is it possible that there's a tree of height h minus 1 sitting there and another tree of height h sitting here? Previous to the insertion, what was the height of this tree? What must the height of this tree have been? Before the insertion. Before I performed it, there was an, I wrote here, insert occurred here. And, you know, Nobody asked me a question about why I know that the insert occurred there, but so I assume you all know. So what was the height of this tree before the insert occurred? Was it H? Why not? Why couldn't it have been H before the uh, insertion occurred? Yeah, if it was H already before I inserted something, then A would have height H plus 1, B would have height H plus 2, and Z would have height H minus 1, and the difference between H plus 1 and H minus 1 is more than 1. And so we would have been out of balance before the insertion. So we know what happened. We know the insert occurred in this tree, and we know that that insertion caused that tree to go from height H minus 1 to height H. And that's what caused the imbalance, because it caused this heights to bump up all the way up, you know, all the way up to B and even beyond B. The heights went up by some. So prior to this insertion, we know what the height of B was. Prior, before the insertion, what was the height of B? Height of B is equal to h plus 1. And we know the height of this node here was h minus 1 before the insertion. Is it becoming less mysterious, all these h's? And, and I just chose h as a variable. I just chose it just to sort of illustrate the difference between the heights of the different subtrees that are shown here. 
Is it a little less mysterious? Okay. Um, look what happens after we perform the rotation. This is, this is the let's perform the rotation arrow. So let's perform the rotation. After we perform the rotation, the tall subtree, this x subtree, is now the direct child of A. And the other two subtrees have been pushed down one level with B. So B's height is down here as H. And A's height, which is A is now the root of the subtree, A's height is now H plus 1. So it has the same height, this subtree has the same height now as it had before we performed the insertion. Height is the same as what it was before the insertion. So what? Well, it tells you, so why? So who cares? So the heights of the ancestors don't care, don't change, so what? How do we know that? Because before the insertion, it was an AVL tree, and we've done a rotation, and now this child, this node here, not a child, the root, is now it has the same height as before, and so 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 now all the ancestors of up here, all these heights, all the way up to the root of the tree, all of those heights stay the same. And then you jumped to, it's got to still be an AVL tree. How did you get there? Uh, I'm just curious. I mean, you're right, but I'm just curious. Because we know that we had height H plus 1 before, and we know that it was an AVL tree before. So where, okay, so great. So if this height, if the height at node A is restored to, this height of this subtree is restored to being H plus 1, what are the other heights in the tree going to be? I mean, all the heights that are out here, you know, there's like zillions of subtrees all over the place. All these heights, what's going to happen to those heights? And in particular, what about all these heights? If we restore this, the height of this tree, this whole big tree that's sitting here, if we restore its height to being h plus 1, which is what it was before the insertion, what happens to all the other heights? They don't change. Every other height in the tree is the same. So if I check the balance prior to performing the insertion, if I check the balance before that, if I knew that the balance was true, if balance property was true for pre-insertion tree, then the balance property will be true for post-rotation tree. Because this tree is balanced. And all of the other heights have not changed in the entire tree. So balance is a height property. If it hasn't changed, then we're good. Yep. So how do we know the answer? Ah, so because we, yeah, so, so how do I know that? So there was, a, there was a node here that I chose as being the uh, node that's out of balance. So how did I choose this node? Which node is the node that's out of balance? Maybe when I insert something into the tree, I get a thousand nodes that are out of balance. This is your question, I'm guessing. How do I know that I'm fixing it by fixing it for this one node? Okay, you think about that for a second, and I'll write down what I'm supposed to write down here after this. So, so we don't need to update heights uh, of A.
that says any more on any move. Okay, so you tell me what node did I choose to perform my rotation at? You guys are going to invent insertion. <clears throat> You're going to invent insertion into an ADL tree right here. Somebody came in, they inserted a node into this ADL tree. It caused imbalance. It actually could have caused imbalance in several places. But we picked a particular node to change the balance at. We picked a particular node to perform the rotation at. What node did we pick? Yeah. We picked the lowest height um, node that was in the next list balance. Every node below it could be in balance, nothing below it will be in balance. Uh, you, that would be the highest. So the highest. You want the highest one? The highest one that is in balance. The highest out of balance node. Okay. I'll put that in my one hand. What's the other option? The lowest. I got the highest and I got the lowest. Which one do you want me to rotate at? So you understand that when I perform an insertion, where are the out of balance nodes going to be? If I perform an insertion into a binary search tree, and it, an AVL tree, and it changes the AVL tree into something that's still a binary search tree but is out of balance, where are those imbalances going to appear? Not at the leaf. No, the leaf is never going to be out of balance because both of its children are height minus one. But where is the imbalance going to occur? What are the set of nodes that you'd have to worry about in this tree? If the insertion occurs here, could it be that that causes imbalance here, or here, or here? Where could the imbalance occur? Remember, imbalance is a function of height. So if heights don't change, the balance property doesn't change. So where do the heights change when I insert a node into this tree? Where are the only places that it could possibly change? Yeah, exactly right. Not even almost the root, all the way to the root. It could possibly change the entire height of the tree. So it's, it's exactly after I perform an insertion, the nodes I have to worry about are the nodes all the way along this path to the root. That's the only nodes I have to worry about because those are the only ones that are involved in having children that might have had their heights changed. So the only node that's causing any height change is this guy. And if you're not an ancestor of that new node, your height is not changing. So I've got to go up this path, figuring out about new heights and things like that. And, you know, somebody wants to start at the top and go down and find the first place where it's out of balance. I want to fix it immediately. I want to fix it immediately where it occurs lowest in the tree. Why would I want to do that? Because after I fix it, I don't have to worry about it again. The height has been restored to what it was before. That means everybody in this ancestor chain all the way up to the root, balance does not change for those people. It's the same balance as it was in the original AVL tree because the height has been restored to H minus one. So when I insert, and this is exactly the insertion code, you insert, and then when you back up out of the recursion, you check heights for balance. If it's OK, 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 fails, stop. Perform rotation, it fixes everything up. And you can declare victory and just say, I'm done. You don't have to do anything else. Though, of course, you do have to crawl out of the recursive calls still. OK, but don't worry, if you didn't get that, it's going to come again, because I have some bad news for you. Yeah? Okay. <coughs> Just to make sure, uh, <coughs> ancestors refer to uh, A, 
Ancestor of this down here? An ancestor in a tree is a node that's on the path from the node you're talking about to the root. Those are the ancestors of a node. The height of B is right? Height of B is B was an ancestor of the node that we inserted. It's not, isn't that an ancestor? It is. B is an ancestor. Yeah. Yeah. After I perform the rotation, then the height of the ancestors don't change. So all the ancestors of A in the new tree don't change. This is after. Uh, so this is after the rotation. In this case, it refers to everything that's on this path up to the root. This is only a part of the tree. Like for example, in our previous example here, this is the chain. And those after this rotation, all the heights res are restored for those nodes back to what they were before, before the insertion. And before the insertion, this this tree had height three, and its left child had height two. It refers it, re it returns to that. Yeah. If it inserted here, yeah. then this thing would be possibly the tree that goes to height h, right? It could be that it's going from h minus 1 to h, and this guy could stay at h minus 1. That's what you're saying? Yeah. And it gets out of balance from there? Yeah. yeah. This is not the end of the story. That's the sad part. So this is what you asked about. If I insert a new node, and instead of sticking off of something nice, it comes down here. I'm inserting 6. And I get down here, and I find where to put 6. And I put 6 in there, and I change the height on everything. Uh, you actually don't. You only have to change the height up until the first imbalance, but I'm showing you the heights. The new, these are the new heights for the entire tree. Anyway. So I get to this point. I find the node that I that this node number four. I find that node that's out of balance after the insertion. And what do I do? Well, sadly, a single rotation will not fix this problem. If I tried to rotate, what would happen? This tree, which is currently rooted at four, I would say let's reroot it at seven. And I would get a new tree that looks like 7. And then off to this side, I'd have 4. And then this 5, 6 tree would stick off of that. And also there would be a 2 sticking on there. So this is the restructuring of this, this, and this. And I've got to stick 8 on there. And then it still goes up. So that would be the restructuring after a single rotation. But that's bad. We should. But if you do that, you also have to, if you do that, you're still stuck. Suppose we do that. You want to do 4, 2, let's rotate at 7, 5. Uh, you want to bring 5 up, right? Okay. So then I've got 7, 8, 6. Keep going. It's good. Let me tell you, though, this is where Adelson Velsky and Landis, this is where they made their contribution. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, you are absolutely right. Yeah, I did this incorrectly. So you want to bring five up. Then, okay, then we've got 6, and then we've got 7 and 8. So what are these six? On the, on the 
I don't know. I don't know how to rotate this tree. Maybe I do. Hold on. Let's check. You know how to rotate it. Okay, so you're saying five goes at the top. Seven goes over here. Oh, I see. You want to put six here and eight here. Oh, that makes sense. Sadly, it's still not in balance. We're in trouble. I mean, this really is where they did their job. This is why their name's attached to the structure, because everybody could do a single rotation. That's easy. But the trouble was when you got these kinked paths. You know, the insertion occurred not strictly down a left path, but it occurred down a left, right, left, you know, that kind of path, a zigzaggy path. And so their fix is to do what's called a double rotation. So double rotation looks like this. So it's two rotations, one of which is this rotation, which is actually what you invented here. But then you don't stop. So you do the rotation down below, but then you also do a second rotation one level up, which is this is a rotate right, so this is rotating these guys this way. And then you perform another rotate left, where you rotate these guys this way. That's the blue rotation. And you restore it to something that has height 2, not 3. So it's like magic. It really is a, a right rotation followed by a left rotation at the parent. Now you're thinking, what about triple rotations? That's the great part. That's why they got their name on it, is because that's all. That's all. There's only single rotations and double rotations. That's all you have to worry about. I'll show you this picture for this guy. So this is what double rotation does. It takes this tree that looks like this, and it restructures it to look like this. So in this case, the insertion occurs down in the some, some child of B. And we have to restructure in order to essentially bring B up. So B is the middle node of a chain ABC. And the double rotation brings B up to the top and drops A on the left and C on the right. And then the subtrees figure themselves out by the search tree property. Like, you know, there's W, X, Y, and Z. They have to be put underneath these trees, these nodes, A, B, and C. They have to be put in this order. They have to be put with those connections in order to have the search tree property. So if you can just remember, I mean, if you want, like, what double rotate seems so complicated, but really it's just restructuring three nodes that look like this, or the asymmetric way, like that. It's like an elbow that's bent either bent left or bent right. You just have to restructure those nodes by pulling the bottom one to the top and letting everything go down as it should. So I pull B up to the top, and then I let everything fall. So A goes into the left child spot, C is there, and then all the subtrees arrange themselves below. Oh, I should have asked you this before. Let me ask it to you now. Uh, how much time does it take to do a rotation? How much time does it take to do a double rotation? What has to be done in a double rotation? How much structure needs to change? There are some pointers that change. There's this pointer, 
this pointer, there's this pointer, there's this pointer, there's this pointer, there's... That's it. Five pointers. How much time does this take? Constant. Constant time to perform a rotation. When you see the code, you're going to be like, I can't believe it's that simple. It's like so unbelievable. But it's easy. It's really easy to do. It's just that it looks complicated. But if you keep in mind that it has to be a binary search tree, and you're pulling the low guy up to the top, then double rotation is easy. Double rotation is just remember that, that part. Pull it up to the top. Okay. Uh, we will talk more about ABL trees next time.